Hello, gardeners, and welcome to another edition of Your Gardening Week Live. This is the spot to come on Mondays to get your gardening questions answered, to learn a lot about gardening, and to share some time with a gardening community from all over the world. So welcome to everybody. Good to see lots of people checking in. I'm working with some new software today. I'll tell you more about this, but for instance, I can say good morning to the brew captain who's checking in from Louisiana. And I can say hello, Brian, who's checking in as well. So I've got some new software. I'm working on it, learning a little bit about it today. I think it's going to add a nice element to the show. Also, when you have a question, I can pop it up on the screen so everybody knows that's what we're talking about. Great to see everybody here. Look at my background. This is what I woke up to this morning. It is a warm morning. This is the warmest we've been in quite a while. It is five degrees Fahrenheit in my garden. That's minus 15 Celsius. And I've seen a lot of you commenting on your cold mornings as well because the middle of the United States has this Arctic freeze rolling through and it's definitely dropping the temperatures everywhere. So thought I'd show you what my garden looks like right now just because it's one of those things that it's real time and it's definitely cold out there. But to move forward with the rest of the program, I'm going to go ahead and shift over to this screen. This was the picture I took right before the last freeze I had uh, last month, or I should say the first freeze I had last month and killed the plant. So cold morning. I'd rather look at some nice green plants to get the day started. Pat Patrick, thank you for that super chat. That's a wonderful way to start today. So thank you so much for that. And thank you all who are attending. I've noticed that there's some talk already going on today before the show started about horseradish. So I'll just spend a few seconds talking about horseradish. I do grow horseradish. I've been growing the same horseradish plant for over 20 years. About 20 years ago, I planted horseradish in a garden. Every time I've moved and gone to a new garden, I just dug up some of the roots because horseradish is extremely easy to grow for many of us. It likes a nice rich soil. All you need is a little chunk of root and you can put that in soil and it'll grow into a nice plant. So the horseradish I have right now is a clone of the plant that I've been growing for 20 years. Great plant. I love to harvest the root and use it fresh on top of a nice grilled steak. Oh, it's so wonderful. The taste is far superior to anything you can get in a jar. If you don't disrupt the roots, you may be able to keep horseradish under control. But especially in rich soil, in an environment that it really likes, it can spread. And in that very first garden where I grew horseradish, it spread dramatically. I had it in a 12 inch deep bed, little raised bed, but the bottom was open and it escaped out the bottom. So now when I grow horseradish, I keep it in a fully enclosed container. I'm growing it in one of my metal raised beds so it doesn't escape. I encourage you grow horseradish. Prepper Chris, thank you for that super sticker in the morning as well. And Janice Moore, thank you for the super sticker. Super sticker, great way to get started. Those of you that were here last week heard me talk about my bout with skin cancer and the treatment that I was undergoing. I'm still showing my face this week to show that I'm healing. It's getting better. I still have some telltale signs on my face from the healing. I didn't want to hide that from you because I know so many of you have expressed such heartfelt concerns about my health. My health is great. I'm healing. Things are moving forward. And we're going to move on with the show. But just in case, well, I'll say I'm a little self-conscious about it. And just in case you might feel a little concerned staring at my face for the next 90 minutes as you see a not completely pretty picture, I decided to try something new this week. And if this works out well, and I have no doubt that it will, I'm going to repeat this in the future. I've got a surprise guest today. And so this is an opportunity for me to 
work on this new software to really try to make this broadcast better for you. And so I have the opportunity now of having guests on the show. And I really look forward to that opportunity. We'll have to figure out who they are in the future. I have some ideas. But for the beginning, I've invited my hmm. daughter, Kiri, to the show. And so Kiri is the one that works <laughs> behind the scenes. And we've talked about her in recent weeks. She's the one that takes care of the live chat uh, after the fact and does a lot of the information to help me prepare for the following week's show. So I have her today to share some behind the scenes information about the Gardner Scott live stream. She's also an expert chicken lady. So we're going to talk about chickens here in a little bit. And believe it or not, even though she's been my daughter for longer than I've been an active gardener, uh, she's just getting into gardening recently. So she's also a brand new gardener and is going to share some of her thoughts. So, Kiri, welcome to the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Hi. <laughs> I want to go ahead and um, first off, welcome you as I have, but uh, just let people know what your role is in this show. So spend a couple of minutes, if you would, just talking about what you do to help out the channel. All right. So every week after the live stream is posted onto YouTube, I go and I watch the whole thing and I read every single comment that you guys post. I take the any questions that Gardner Scott doesn't answer and I put them into a Word document for him with your name, who asked the question, what the question was. And in addition to that, I if somebody responds to the question, so if Heidi or Jay or Jennifer or whoever um, gives an answer on the live chat, I also copy that into the Word document so that he can see if you know the question was answered or not, or if it's something that maybe he needs to touch on again next week. Um, I also take down all of the questions that he does answer during the live stream. Um, and the, um, I have a section called notable comments. So anytime somebody says, Gardner Scott, this is my first time on the channel. Um, I love you so much. Or, um, you know, last week, all of your well wishes and prayers for, for the skin cancer. I copied all of those down to make sure that he sees all of those. Um, when people say, oh, you're the Bob Ross of gardening, or has anybody told you you look like Jeff Bridges? I copy all of that down and add that as well. Um, and I also do the timestamps. So as I'm taking down all the questions, I, um, note down which, what the topic is and, um, you know, what we talk about and yeah. <laughs> and I'll also point out that, that you've been <clears throat> very resilient and flexible as we've been developing this this process because uh, I asked you recently, I'll often be talking and say, oh, I have a video that talks about that, mm -hmm. or oh, I refer to that, or check out this new video. And so Kiri also um, is giving me that information. So in the last couple weeks, I've been adding that to the live stream replay. So if I'm referring to a particular topic that we're talking about based on your <coughs> questions, and I refer to one of my videos where I already talk about that subject. Well, Kiri makes note of that as well, and then lets me know, because I often forget what I've said as to which video I'm referring to, and so she'll give me that information as well. So if you watch this in replay, after the timestamps, now you'll also see links to the specific videos <clears throat> that are referenced in the live chat as well. So um, that's something new we just started and Kiri jumped right in and added that as well. <clears throat> so lots of people are saying thanks, <clears throat> appreciate your work, 
Um, it's so nice to see um, Jean-Pierre is giving both of us a nice little awesome <laughs> sign. So that's wonderful as well. So uh, I want to bring Kiri on, not only just to introduce her because I'm so proud of her for being my daughter, of course, um, but also because she does have expertise of her own. I do not have chickens. They're in my plan. I've talked about chickens in the past in a number of different live chats and occasionally in some videos. But I also wanted Kiri to just talk about her chickens and chickens in the garden. I use chicken manure that I get from Kiri. Um, but as far as chickens are concerned, she's quite involved in the chicken community. So why don't you go ahead and share some of that now? All right. Um, I'm actually looking out my window at my chicken coop right now. And since the temperature here is like five degrees Fahrenheit, my chickens are still in bed. <laughs> they decided not to come out this morning. <laughs> um, I initially did not want chickens. My husband tried to convince me for years to get some chickens and I kept saying, no, we don't need them. It's too much of a hassle. And we went to a sustainable living show about five years ago and they had some chickens there. And once I saw how my kids fell in love with the chickens um, on the way home that day, we stopped by Big R and we got some chickens. <laughs> We started out with five um, and we have had dozens of chickens in the last five years. Right now we have 11. Um, but earlier this summer we were up to 19. We, uh, it, chickens are addicting. Um, every fall and every spring the feed stores have chickens. They, they put out baby chicks. And almost every fall and every spring, we get baby chicks. <laughs> um, and so we have actually started raising chickens for friends a little bit. Um, we have the whole setup. So um, we have, um, let's see, keeping them warm in the coop. I just see the question pop up. So we do what's called the deep litter method, where you put as much um, material on the bottom of the coop, a couple inches, six or so, what we use are wood shavings. And we get those at a Big R is the feed store that we go to. Um, and you just keep adding them. And as the chickens kick them out or as they get kind of stamped down, you just keep adding more. Um, of the the litter you can use straw you can use the wood shavings i know some people use sand and you just um turn it um occasionally like once a, every two weeks or so kind of just take a shovel or a pitchfork and turn turn it over and actually the um, ammonia that's in the chicken's excrement it gets turned into um in all of the, the litter on the bottom. And that kind of creates some heat of its own that keeps the chickens warm. Um, making sure that you don't have any drafts in the coop and that if you, you do need to have ventilation, but it should be above the chickens heads. Um, and no water in the coop. So their water should be kept outside of the coop because the water creates the moisture which can can hurt them and give them um, frostbite. <laughs> so that's how I keep my chickens warm. But you also have to remember that they're basically wearing a down coat. Um, they are birds. They're made to be outside and they will be okay. <laughs> so. And so what's the, the best benefit? Um, so you've got the chickens <clears throat> now, you keep getting chickens, you lose chickens, you get more chickens. So what would you say is the benefit? What, why do you continue to have chickens? What, what would be your top three reasons? Um, the baby chickens are cute. That would be a big reason. And my girls really, really love to raise the chickens. Um, and they're, they're easy when they're, when they're little and when they're big, they're easy. 
Um, the eggs, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, a chicken will lay an egg a day, pretty much, during the summertime. Um, and then in the wintertime, it does go down a little bit, and we get a couple eggs a week from each chicken. Um, and they're just, they're fun to watch. <laughs> um, we like to, you know, just sit and watch them. Some breeds are, are friendlier than others, but for the most part, our chickens let us go out and pet them and, and pick them up and, and they're, they're just fun. <laughs> uh, so, um, how many chickens do you have right now? We have 11 right now. And how many chickens did you have at your highest point? 19. <laughs> okay. So um, it, it all sounds good. And I've had chickens before, too. And I, like I said, I want to have chickens again. Uh, but what are some of the, the detrimental aspects? What are some of the problems? Like, for instance, why do you no longer have 19 chickens? Um, well, of the 19 that we did have this summer, we gave away most of those. Um, but in the past, we have had predators get into our coop and get our chickens. Um, we have raccoons in our area, and we also have fox and um, birds of prey. We have owls and hawks. And so we do have our run covered. We let our chickens out sometimes um, in the big yard, but for the most part, they stay in the covered run. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's hard to deal with when, especially if you have to explain it to kids. <laughs> right. Um, and we also have dogs as well. So we keep our dogs away from the chickens. Um, and so talk about that. How do you, um, keep the dog separated? Cause I've, I've answered a couple questions about that already. Mm -hmm. And that's been some of the concern is, um, dogs and chickens. So we keep our dogs completely separate. Um, we have a bird dog. She's Beagle and Weimaraner mix, and that's what she was bred for. And so she, it doesn't go around the chickens at all. Um, we have a separate yard on the side of the house that's fenced off, completely separate from the dog where the dogs go. And then within that yard, we have the run and the coop that are also um, fenced off. But I do have friends who have introduced their dogs to the chickens. And they just started when the chicks were little um, and started bring, bringing the dog around them and having her on a leash and, you know, just telling her to be nice. And if she started to get rough, tell her no. And their dogs and their chickens free range in the yard together. And it works for them. So I think it depends on the dog and how much work you're willing to put into it. Good, um, good point. And so um, Greg is asking a question yes. about living in the city because there might be an assumption because I live outside of town and I have some property with my garden. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you live and how do you have your coop set up? I live in the city. I live in a neighborhood and we are allowed to have chickens. Um, in, in our city limits, you can have 10 chickens, so might be a little over that. Um, they only count as chickens once they're over six months old. So you can have 10 chickens above six months old, but no roosters. Um, and we just have, like I said, we have a, a separate little side yard. And that's where we built our coop with our run. And um, we have we have quite a few people in our neighborhood who have coops and chickens. Um, some people use a shed out in the backyard as their coop. Um, we actually have friends who have a playhouse that they use as their coop for their chickens. <laughs> and, and so when you say in town, um, it's... It's the kind of thing. So how much space is separating your coop from your neighbor's yard? <clears throat> um, we actually, we don't have any sort of limitations on that. And so our coop is right against our fence by our neighbor's yard. And have <laughs> they complained about it? Do you share eggs with them? So how, how have you dealt with neighbors? Or I, sh or I should ask, 
have you had any problems with neighbors? Have the neighbors been entirely supportive? Or if you had some issues, how have you dealt with those issues with neighbors having a coop in the middle of the city? Um, we have had no issues with neighbors. We've never had any neighbors complain. Um, occasionally, my girls will go out and give some eggs away to the neighbors. Um, and I actually have neighbors across the street who we got them into chickens because we let her borrow some at the end of the growing season last year. And she put them in her greenhouse and they cleaned out her greenhouse for her. And she was supposed to give them back, but ended up keeping them, which was totally fine. And she now has her own coop with her own flock. <laughs> That's great. So. <laughs> so if someone's interested in starting their own small flock of getting some chickens, um, how did you learn and what would you recommend for getting people started with chickens? <clears throat> I would say start small. Um, just get a couple. I mean, we started with five. Um, and you, when, when they're little, you need to have them in a space that's heated. Um, with a, a heat lamp, kind of like a, like a, a reptile would have in their tank. Um, and we didn't have a coop or a run or anything when we very first um, got our chickens. And we just had them in, we actually had them in a playpen. And then we just, we, we, d we chose to build our coop. You can buy prefabricated coops but they can be fairly expensive. Um, right. So we, we just kind of found some plans online and built our own coop and then built them a little fenced in yard. <laughs> and I don't know, somehow we ended up with 19 chickens. <laughs> and, and I know you don't stay home every day of the year. So what do you do with the chickens when you go on vacation or go camping or leave for a few days at a time? Um, so if we are just camping for a day or two, I just leave the chickens. Um, we have a big five gallon feeder and a five gallon water jug. And we just make sure that they are filled up and we leave them. <laughs> um, I know some areas and some, some coops and some people feel better about locking them up every night, but, um, once we had our, our run pretty predator proof, we just um, leave them when we go out of town. If we're going to be gone for more than a few days, then we get a friend to come over. Um, just uh, They can watch our dogs and they come watch our chickens. That's good. That's good. And mm -hmm. I want to give a shout out to Carla. She's here every week, as you know, Carrie, because you see the mm -hmm. comments every week. So, Carla, thank you for being here yet again, and thank you for that super chat contribution. That's always so welcome. Uh, some of you are probably new to the channel. Um, I see a lot of people that are asking questions that are regulars that I know are here every week. And so if you're new to the channel, or even if you're a regular and you haven't asked questions before, one of the things that I'm trying this week, and you may have already picked up on this, <clears throat> while Kiri is talking about in this case chickens i'm more active on the chat so i'll actually be answering chat questions <clears throat> on the chat while she's talking on the video and then when i pop back to the video i'll also be answering some questions but i just wanted to let you know that i'm not sitting out this week that i'm still answering the questions whether it's on the chat or whether it's on the screen like this um, just trying to throw some information at you if you're just joining the stream right now this is my daughter, Kiri, and she's the one that does the behind the scenes work for me every week so that I am well aware of the questions you ask, the questions I can't get to, and topics that I need to discuss for each week's show. So uh, that's why I asked her here. I'm also experimenting with some new technology, new software to try to make this experience better for you. So that's why she's here. That's why we're trying this new experiment. And I welcome everyone who has been checked in, all the regulars and all the new people as well. And if you're watching on replay, uh, go ahead and ask in the comments section below because you might not be here live, but I can still answer your questions after the fact. So, um, great. 
lots of good information about chickens. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Carrie is so much into chicken. She wears a lot of chicken shirts as well. So um, <laughs> she participates in a lot of different chicken forums. And that aspect is, is extremely <clears throat> great. But as I mentioned earlier, I also asked her here today because she's a new gardener, which may be surprising. So I've been gardening for decades, but I really got serious about gardening when my kids were preteens and I asked them to help me create the garden space. And it was much bigger than it needed to be. And as you might guess, with preteens and teens, they lost interest quite early. And <laughs> it's just now that she's developing the interest again. So um, I'll ask you, Kiri, what are some of your earliest uh, memories as far as gardening goes, your experiences that may have led you to now <coughs> want to start gardening again? <laughs> well... One of my earliest memories of your gardens, and I know I saw uh, my brother check in a little bit earlier. If he's still on here, I'm sure he'll remember this as well. But the house that we lived in had um, a very sloped backyard that was full of rocks. And we spent many, many, many weekends out there with a wheelbarrow picking up thousands of rocks <laughs> to create the landscape that Gardner Scott needed to build his garden. <laughs> and I suspected that would be one of your earliest memories. And that's kind of what I was referring to about losing interest. I am not an advocate of using rocks in your landscape. Um, there are so many better choices. If you have an area you don't want to grow in, I suggest you use an organic mulch. It will be improving the soil. It'll still keep weeds under control, but you can plant in the wood chip mulch or whatever organic mulch you're using at some point. But this house we moved to, it was the very first house here in Colorado Springs, had almost half of the backyard on a slope that was covered in rock. And it wasn't just rock. It was big fist size rocks, which meant you couldn't rake it, you couldn't shovel it, you had to pick each rock up by hand to move it out of the way. And that's why it was such a, a memorable experience because it wasn't fun at all. But that's what gardeners do to get the space they need to set up a garden. Uh, in this case, it just led to some unpleasant memories which probably tainted your gardening experience for years to come. So what got you into gardening uh, now? most recently. Why why are you counting yourself as a gardener? Um, well, my husband also enjoys gardening. Um, the last house that we lived in, he built some, some raised beds. Um, and we also fenced that off because of our dogs. We did not have chickens at the time. Um, and so he is the one recently who's gotten me more into it. Um, this house that we live in, our backyard is tiered, and so on the upper tiers, we started planting. Um, and I saw a question about the first crops, intro crops. Um, so the first ones that, that we planted were tomatoes and strawberries. We did um, green beans and peas and cucumbers, zucchini. Zucchini is a super easy one to grow but just be prepared to have zucchini coming out your ears. Um, <laughs> so the last couple years we have built our garden up in the tiered part of our backyard. And in the spring, we would be super excited about it and come into July, kind of lose interest and kind of realized that it was the location of the garden because we'd have to climb up um, go through a fence to get there. And so this year we built some raised beds right outside our back door. And I can see them from my kitchen window. And we actually saw the garden through to the end of the season. <laughs> um, we planted tomatoes, we did peppers, we did strawberries, we did cucumbers and zucchini. And 
Green beans. And, and what was <laughs> what was your favorite tomato that you harvested this year? Well, the Galileo moon, of course. <laughs> That's right. So some of you have heard me talk about the Galileo moon tomato. So when I was at the Galileo garden, uh, I grew thousands of tomato plants each year, many of them to plant, many of them to sell in at the plant sale that I talked about last week. And in growing those thousands of tomatoes, one year I discovered a couple plants that had some genetic mutations. And so I separated out those plants and I've been growing them and saving the seeds for years. And one of them I call the Galileo moon. I, of course, planted them in my garden this year, but they were killed by the frost. But I gave Kiri one of those plants. And so she was able to actually get a generation of Galileo moon tomatoes this year. And I've already saved some of those seeds. So I hope at in the future, at some point, and I've talked about this in the past in some videos, but I do hope at some point to actually start releasing these seeds and give them away so that others around the world can start growing the Galileo moon tomato as well. <laughs> so um, that, I just had to give that little plug because I know that you like doing the Galileo moon. Yes. Uh, so as a new gardener, especially in a region like our Zone 5B <laughs> Colorado short season, um, what were some of the important lessons you learned this year as to what you did right, what you did wrong, what you're going to do next year. Because I'm always talking about this, about trying to learn from your garden <coughs> each year and then carry it forward. So what was it that, that you're carrying forward? Um, so I kept a gardening journal for the first time this year. <laughs> I know that Gardener Scott has talked a lot about that, and I highly recommend it. I drew a map of all of the boxes and exactly what plant we placed in each spot. And I also wrote down how the plant did, um, what kind of a harvest we got. Um, and I learned that next year I need to change the layout of where we plant things. I also learned that I need to research more about how big some plants get. So <laughs> we planted quite a few different varieties of tomatoes and I learned the difference between determinate and indeterminate <laughs> this year. <laughs> and um, I had some that grew a lot bigger than I was expecting them to. And they shaded some of my other plants. Um, so one of those was a, a pepper plant that we had planted right next to, I think it was a Kellogg's breakfast tomato. And after that first freeze at the beginning of September, um, the tomato plant didn't make it, it started dying. And as soon as it, it's the, the leaves started wilting and it, it, it kind of died, I realized that my pepper plant was now getting sun and it started blossoming and growing when I had thought that it just wasn't a good plant or maybe it, it wasn't a good, it, it wasn't a good plant for us to plant here, but it turns out that it was just being shaded by the giant tomato plant. So the sun really is important. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and, and paying attention to where the sun hits in your yard is very important. <laughs> and so um, talk a little bit about where your last garden was, where where your husband had it up on the hill and why now you think it didn't work up there and what you did different this year, which made a difference of why you were able to grow. Um, so before we had to kind of climb up on the tiers and go through a fence to get up there. And it was just out of the way and too much work. And so now it, my garden boxes are literally right outside my door. Um, the hose reaches it just fine. And the kids are also able to reach it better. And so I could send them out there to water the garden, whereas before um, they really couldn't get up to it. And so it was just in a better location overall. <laughs> All right, so last week, um, and you saw this, we had the background picture was from Michelle Deal. 
and she had some beds on her concrete patio. And so you say it's just outside your back door and yours mm -hmm. also are on top of your concrete patio, aren't they? Yes, they are. And so have you had any issues? Now your beds are, are made out of wood and Michelle's mm -hmm. are made out of concrete blocks. But a lot, as I talked about last week when we were discussing Michelle, how you can have a raised bed in just about any location as long as it has the sun. Uh, you discovered that the sunniest spot in your yard is on your patio just outside mm -hmm. your back door. So you built those beds, put them on the concrete pad, and had, did that lead to any issues or problems having those beds on the concrete? Nope. Nope. We... Um... We did have to truck in the soil and we did a, a mix of the compost and um, topsoil to do that, which was a lot of wheelbarrow loads back there. But um, no, we haven't had any issues with um, the soil, you know, coming out the bottom or anything. Um, and it actually, I think, creates some pretty nice drainage. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Uh, and Elena's asking about um, mm -hmm. a fruit orchard where the old garden was. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about if that will work for you or not? So we do actually have a couple um, fruit trees up there. Um, we have apples, I believe, peaches. I'm not sure what else. And my husband is probably annoyed that I don't remember, but it's okay. <laughs> um, and they... They do okay, but there's our neighbor has a giant tree that um, shades much of that part of the yard, and I just don't think that they get quite enough sun up there. And um, and I, I think in my experience, um, the weather here hasn't helped very much with the the fruit trees either, <laughs> and getting too cold. Yeah, and, and so I've got fruit trees. I've shown that, um, the starting of that in some of my videos. Um, this is a tough region. And so where we live in Colorado is extremely dry. We have snow today, but this is the first precipitation of any kind we've had in pro about six weeks. And uh, that makes it really hard for starting young trees, especially young fruit trees, and then keeping them watered. And the season is often too short to even get the fruit. So even if you can grow the tree, you might not be able to get a harvest. I, I had apricot trees. This was at the house where we picked up all those rocks. And in a five-year period, I only had a harvest one year because we have such late spring freezes and early fall freezes that really impacts the, the tree. So it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, a lot of us are growing trees like you, but getting the harvest and getting a big tree often doesn't work as effectively as it could. Um, yeah, and Lena says it's hard that um, also in zone 5B, um, apples typically do okay. Um, but yeah, there are bad years even for apples as well. And this is one of those things just to, to keep aspect or keep in, in touch with. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk on the chat, Kiri. I don't know if you saw much of it about rock picking back and forth. So it's really great to see the conversation because obviously we weren't the only ones that had to deal with rocks and picking them out of the, the area. So keep your questions coming. Keep the chat going. If you've got questions for me, by all means, ask those in the chat. If you have questions for Kiri, Ask those in the chat as well. Uh, I know that you had some other stuff you want to talk about. So what else is on your list that you wanted to share with us today? Um, well, going back to chickens real quick, I have seen a couple questions about how much um, it costs to raise the chickens. And it, it really isn't too expensive. Um, when you buy chicks, they cost between, just for a, a general backyard breed, they cost between $2 and $5 for each chicken. Um, the initial setup is probably the most expensive just to get the, the lights and to get the feeder and the water if you're going to buy a coop or if you're going to build a coop. Um, but then once you get them outside, 
we buy 40 pound bags of feed and they, it's about $15 for a 40 pound bag of feed. And that lasts us um, about three weeks or so. And so we're spending less than $30 a month to feed our chickens, which that's more than a dozen eggs costs, but um, you know, for us, it's worth it to to have the chickens. Well, but you also get the chicken manure, and that's you yes. know, now I I benefit. Um, one of the problems with the um, the deep litter method, like you practice, is you don't have to clean your coop as often, um, which means I don't get the chicken manure as often. But I consider <clears throat> that a huge benefit, even if the actual cost of the chickens may be more than the cost of the eggs. Uh, there's other benefits as well, as far as um, doing things like chicken manure. Now, I know you keep your chickens in the coop because you're in the city. But for those of you that are interested in chickens with a little bit more space, letting them free roam in the garden, especially this time of year in the northern hemisphere in the fall, they will clean up the garden. They'll, they'll eat a lot of those insect eggs that would be overwintering. They'll eat the larva. Uh, they take care of a lot of those harmful pests that would be overwintering in your garden without you having to do any effort at all. And they'll scratch up the soil. If you use them in the spring for the same reason, they'll start getting your soil nice and loose and ready for you to to plant. I don't recommend putting chickens in the garden when plants are actively growing, but in the spring and the fall, it can be a great way to clean up the garden. So that's really good. Uh, okay, what else have you got for us today? Um, let's see. <laughs> and, and Carrie actually made a long list of notes that she wanted to share <laughs> some of her experiences. Yep. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about my front yard a little bit as well. And I saw a comment earlier about strawberries and getting runners from Gardner Scott. And I actually have done that quite a few times. Um, we have strawberries planted in our backyard in the garden beds, but we also have some strawberries planted in the front yard. And it's just, they're on the ground at the bottom of our porch steps and they are pretty much there to feed the rabbits. <laughs> um, and that just, I think two years ago, I had some extra strawberry plants and I thought, what should I do with these? And I had space, so I planted them and the rabbits like them. Um, and they have, since I planted the strawberries, I've noticed that the rabbits have not been eating my petunias, um, so. I know I see lots of questions from people about how to keep pests away. Right. And, know, um, and that's something that, that Gardener Scott recommends a lot is to actually feed them something else so that they stay away from what you don't want them to eat. And I have seen that work in my front yard. The rabbits don't eat my flowers because I feed them strawberries. <laughs> That's good. And that, that's actually a good good tip. And I want to thank Linda Hardwick for that super chat as well. She says, not only do I admire your transparency regarding your skin cancer, but I commend your continuing ed in technology so you can maximize our learning. I appreciate that, Linda. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's what we're all about is sharing information. And that's for those of you that are just joining now. Uh, this is my daughter, Kiri. She does a lot of behind the scenes work for the Gardner Scott channel. So I wanted to introduce her, but also let her share some of her experiences. Also, with that idea of transparency, sure, I've been doing this for decades and I've got a lot of information, but I think it's also important that we all share our experiences back and forth. So even experienced gardeners can learn from brand new gardeners. Brand new gardeners can learn from other brand new gardeners because you can see that we're all in this together and learning things as we go along. So um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit, because I know both you and your husband have been quite active this last week. Um, you're, you're growing, you have your chickens, but mm -hmm. let's talk about preservation, because I think it's important to not only have your garden and eat your food, but if you do it right, you're often growing more than you can use. So 
Let's talk a little bit about what you guys do to preserve food in your household. So we do quite a bit of canning. Um, we do pickled green beans, our favorite. And um, I know Gardner Scott used to do the pickled green beans. And my husband's grandfather used to make pickled green beans as well. And so that's one of the big, the biggest crop we grow is green beans so that we can use them to pickle ourselves. And we usually end up doing probably two dozen pints of pickled green beans. And those last us two the whole dozen year. Pints. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot. Yes, it <laughs> but is. we eat them. <laughs> and we make some spicy. We make some not so spicy. Um, and we have friends that request them um, whenever we go to a party or a potluck or we have friends over. Everybody always wants the pickled green beans. <laughs> um, we also make salsa. Um, my husband does the salsa more than I do. But this year we were not able to use anything from our garden to make the salsa. But um, again, it's we do a couple dozen pints of salsa each year. And same thing, do some spicy, do some mild, we do some chunky, we do some pureed. Um, we've made hot sauce a couple times. And um, then pickles, actually. This is the first year that we've made pickles. And our first batch of pickles were a little bit too mushy for our liking. And so we just tried again. And we are, that's kind of our venture right now is pickles. Uh, that's good. And, and actually, um, they used uh, the pickle recipe for fermenting pickles that I had in a recent video as well. Mm -hmm. A key point for making the pickles, and I think this was something that they discovered, I made my pickles fresh from the garden. The cucumbers were pickling cucumbers as fresh as possible. They fermented, and they were naturally crunchy just because they were so fresh. And if you pickle older pickles or if you tried or older cucumbers or if you try to pickle cucumbers that aren't specifically pickling cucumbers they might be softer they won't be as crisp but you can do things like adding tannic acid or bay leaves or grape leaves um, into the the solution to help keep the cucumbers a little firmer a little more crisp and so that's what you guys are doing right now right yes Okay, so yep. um, it just started. I know they've just been doing this last couple of days, so it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how they do. But the taste is great, right? Yes. Yep. It tastes like a pickle. Yeah. <laughs> All homemade and just just using the simple fermentation mm -hmm. of um, basically just salt and dill and garlic is the way I make mine. Did I know you guys like things a little <clears throat> spicier? So did you add some mm -hmm. red pepper? Um, we did. The first batch that we made had red pepper, and the second one, we didn't make it spicy. Um, one of my girls loves spicy foods, and the other one, too much pepper is too spicy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and Lauraful is actually saying <clears throat> that um, when you pickle radishes, that it tends to um, cut the heat out. And I've noticed this as well, because I'll pickle garlic. And mm -hmm. by pickling the garlic, it also cuts down on the heat. So the whole process of pickling can often take away some of those negative aspects of some of the, the things that we're growing in our garden. So I think that part of it is, is great as well. So, um, so got lots of interest. Gardening in the North is talking about salsa. That actually sounds mm -hmm. really good. Zucchini <coughs> salsa and salsa verde. Uh, and, and you make salsa verde, or I should mm -hmm. say, both of you are making salsa verde on a regular basis, right? Yes. <laughs> yep, we do the, the green salsa as well. Um, when we make that, we do pretty much have to go buy everything at the store. Because we don't have, we don't grow the tomatillos or the chilies. Um, but, but yeah, green salsa is a favorite as well. Good, good. Uh, and so I, I see the numbers are slowly climbing as people are joining on this frigid morning for <laughs> some of us out here. Um, and so for those of you that are just joining the stream, this is my daughter, Kiri. She works behind the scenes at the Gardner Scott channel. 
um, but is also a new gardener looking forward to the next season. And we've been talking about chickens and gardening and preserving food. And as you look at your notes, Kiri, I know you've got a lot of information. Um, what else did you want to share with the audience today? Um, so something that I have learned recently um, is I shop a clearance section at the stores for clearance plants. Um, and we have the grocery store here um, always has a whole shelf of clearance plants. Yep. And Same thing. they sometimes they just haven't got enough water. Um, sometimes the, the plant just doesn't look very good. And sometimes the pot is cracked and that's why it's on clearance. And I have had awesome success with buying these super cheap plants and just bringing them back to life. Um, my favorite, uh, I have the front of my house is very shaded. My front yard is shaded and I have big pots out front and I have to plant shade plants in them. And this year I found a coleus plant for 79 cents. <laughs> it was a six pack for 79 cents. The plant looked very, very sad. And I put them into my giant pot in front of my house and it grew better than any plant I have ever planted out there. I had coleus growing up and over the sides of my pot and it cost 79 cents. <laughs> And, and coleus is a shade loving plant that can be hard to grow if it's not in the right area. But mm -hmm. yeah, good example. You put it in the right area and it does extremely well. Okay, so we got a question from um, Basil Fables. Oh. Do you have <laughs> Fables? Do you have a concoction you like to eat? Pickled beets and cottage cheese. That's <laughs> I I. I Probably. <laughs> I've never tried pickled beets and cottage cheese before. Do you have a similar? Because uh, <laughs> like <clears throat> what I like to do with my my pickles, my fermented pickles that I make, I actually like to take tuna and mm -hmm. mix the, the pickles in big chunks with that tuna. So it's the same basic idea, but tuna heavy on the fermented pickles. I am drawing a complete blank of anything that I like to eat right now. <laughs> so you separate out all of your food and eat everything separately. No. <laughs> I just. That's good. Um, Sorry. If you think of something, you can share later. Um, I will. <laughs> John Ann Johnson, um, yes, is also pointing out, and I do the same thing at Lowe's. I. I, I get almost all of my bigger plants and my perennial flowers, typically at Lowe's, um, just because our Home Depot doesn't have the clearance section. But I've, I've, I've grown hundreds of plants in from clearance, 50% off, especially in the fall, because you get one freeze or even a lot of these plants that are grown to be flowering during the middle of the summer. Once their blooms start to fade or once they start getting a little shriveled, a lot of the nurseries and the big box stores will start putting them on clearance. And fall can be a great time to put perennials in the ground. So I've been doing that recently and something I strongly encourage. So that was a good example of getting plants on clearance. Um, mm -hmm. We have Letha Lee that says cottage cheese and kimchi. I haven't tried that, but mm -mm. it actually could be pretty tasty. Um, I've been trying to grow some Napa cabbage to make my own kimchi, but our weather's just been so hot that every time I've tried to grow the Napa cabbage, it's bolted too early, but I will continue to do that. I may have to mix it with cottage cheese if that experiment um, is good. Um, Laura Full is saying tuna yeah. water is delicious. Um, I don't know that I've ever had tuna water. My cats go crazy whenever I open up a can of tuna. They are, wherever they are in the house, they are immediately at my feet <laughs> when I open the tuna. 
<laughs> uh, Lena saying, start drying cherry tomatoes this year and preserving them in oil. That sounds like a great idea. Um, that's, I, I often will freeze the tomatoes. Um, I haven't dried them and saved them in oil. I've done both um, with other type of plants. I'll save like my basil in oil, but I kind of like that idea. Thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's a really nice mm -hmm. idea. Um, yep. yeah, we... A lot of people are saying they're... You're getting hungry now. <laughs> yep. We actually preserved our herbs for the first time this year as well. I created a little herb garden um, in a in a trough, like a horse trough. And I actually put a little fountain in the middle following Gardener Scott's video. <laughs> okay. And, and where did you get the idea for using the trough? From Gardener Scott. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so, like I, I talked about earlier with some of Kiri's earlier memories, but even though it's taken her most of her life now, well, all of her life now to get interested in gardening, um, a lot of what she's doing, she's actually watching the videos and doing it before she asked me about doing it. So, um, you know, occasionally she'll come to me and ask me for advice and recommendations, but she's just like the rest of you watching a video mm -hmm. and trying something new. So that's another reason why I wanted you on, just to share your experiences, because you are really sharing um, what a lot of the rest of the viewers are going through. Yep. Uh, and Greg, thank you so much for that super chat. Um, I appreciate that for both me and my guest today, my daughter, Kiri. <laughs> Um, that's so great. Uh, you you really spend a lot of time, and I really appreciate the time that you spend on this channel. I know you spent time preparing for this live stream today. Um, I heard a little voice in the background. Oh, that's a, a cat. It's that's a cat. cat. <laughs> I thought that might have been one of the granddaughters. Um, no. But if you could, and we haven't talked about this before, but can you share some of your thoughts, some of your ideas I know your husband and you are both now getting more and more interested in gardening, but how are you looking at gardening as a family and for your kids as you move into the future? So the, the girls go out and they help us plant everything. They both really enjoy it and actually argue over who gets to put which plant into the ground. And um, they, I, I feel like are getting more of an appreciation to eat the vegetables and the, the tomatoes because they walk out there and see them on the vine and pick them and pop them in their mouth. <laughs> um, and many times this summer, one of them would come in the house with their hands full of little cherry tomatoes and, and say, I picked 10 of them, but there's only five left because I ate the others. <laughs> um, and it's just fun to see them getting involved as well. They help water the garden. They also argue about whose turn it is to water, um, which hopefully that continues to last. <laughs> <Yep>. um, <laughs> and then we also, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, we like to paint rocks as well. I know you probably saw Gardener Scott's video about painting rocks. And so they have painted some of the label rocks to show, you know, carrots and tomatoes and, and what's planted where. Good, good. And um, I, I understand that at least one of them was planning on watching live. I haven't seen her yes. <laughs> um, comment yet, but we'll give a shout out to the granddaughters if they happen to be watching live because they wanted to to see what was going on today they actually have a snow day because mm -hmm. it's only five degrees fahrenheit minus 15 celsius we don't have a lot of snow a few inches but it's too cold for the kids in our area to actually go to school so um shout out to them because they're doing extremely well in another part of the house so that you can participate today so yes they are <laughs> thank you to you and thank you to them for that um mama cass is saying that they started gardening for the first time this year with two daughters seven and ten not too mm -hmm. far different from yours and mm -hmm. they're very excited about it yeah. what have been some of your your favorite moments i know you shared a little bit but um i you've 
you know, when you, you come out here to my garden and I'll show them the giant turnips and the insects, and I get a lot out of that where I share my garden with the kids and <clears throat> see their eyes light up and have these new experiences. But what are some of your favorite moments um, just in sharing your garden space and your, and ev or even out here, your gardening experiences with them? <laughs> um, we actually had an accidental sunflower grow in one of our beds this year. And we thought about pulling it up because it was just kind of in the way. We didn't want it there, but we left it because it was pretty. And we actually saw a bee one day that had its whole body in one of the little seed pods. <laughs> um, and we just sat there and kind of watched it in the flower. And it, it was super fun. Um, and my youngest now has gotten way into bugs. She really enjoys bugs. And we'll go out and look for grasshoppers and roly polies. And um, that's one of her favorite things to do now. Um, and, you know, just watching them go out there every day and check on if the zucchini got any bigger or if there are any more strawberries. Um, and it's, it's just fun watching them get into the garden. <laughs> That's great. And so, um, yeah, the Tennessee morning is, is mentioning, um, so I'm letting Kiri talk, um, about her stuff and... <clears throat> I'm kind of playing behind the scenes, answering questions in the comments, um, just trying to be a little more active on the community chat this week than I normally am. Um, normally you see my face right up front and it's just all about me talking to you, but I wanted to share this experience to, to have other gardeners involved and I'm trying to be a little more active on the chat. So um, in background mode a little bit today, and it's a little bit of a difference. I've seen some good comments, and I appreciate the positivity. Let me know in the comments um, what you think about this format, having somebody else on the show, because I'm looking forward to moving into some new directions. Not, not every show, but occasionally having a guest who can speak to an area of gardening with some expertise. And Kiri knows a lot more about chickens than I do, so that was one of the things I wanted her on the show for today. But in the future, I, I'm hoping to have some guests with some specific expertise to help out. So if you think that's a good idea, let me know in the comments. If you want it to be just me, let me know in the comments. Um, I'll, I'll definitely have a balance if I move in that direction. But share your thoughts about what you think about the live stream this week because uh, I'm having fun with it. How about you? I'm having fun. <laughs> okay. And I think a lot of you are having fun too, but I don't want to cut down on the amount of information that we're sharing. I know that we've already shared a lot of good information. So this is the Gardner Scott community. It's all about all of you, not just about me. And as you can see with this new technology and new software that I'm playing around with, uh, we're trying to get to the point where it is becoming um, a little bit better for all of us so that we can uh, learn more about gardening, share some of our experiences back and forth, and really get into a situation where we can share the time that we have every Monday so that it's not only educational, but enjoyable. That's kind of what we're after. So lots of good information. Um, more the merrier for sure. It's a, a nice change in format. Love the special guest idea. Um, we've got Bettina saying it's a nice change in the format. So appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think we'll continue with this. I had posted on the community feed um, on the Gunner Scott channel that I was going to do this, and I know that they're or some guesses at who it might be. And some of those guesses I will hope to have as guests in the future. So I appreciate that. Um, so here's a question from M88. What are you guys still growing in your gardens? Why don't you go first? <laughs> so um, after today, we're not growing anything outside 
Um, we do have garlic planted, but that's about all for right now. Everything else is just done with the super cold weather. <laughs> yeah. So if you're just joining or you didn't hear earlier, uh, it is five degrees Fahrenheit right now here in Colorado. It is minus 15 Celsius. I also have my garlic in the ground, and so it's done. Uh, that weather is too cold for even hoops and plastic to protect. So pretty much everything in my garden is done as well. I think the spinach will survive possibly with a lot of damage. The kale might survive with a lot of damage, but my garden is essentially done as well. I'll be cleaning up my perennials because all the perennial flowers are, are going to be gone as a result of this freeze as well. They'll come back in the spring, but as far as what we're growing right now, um, today was essentially the last day. I should say yesterday was the last day in our growing season um, because this cold has just been so severe. Uh, what, Tam Tin Tom is saying it's three degrees Celsius outside right now. That equates to uh, about 38 degrees, so just above freezing. Um, we're supposed to get that tomorrow as our high temperature. And then it's going to bounce back into the 60s and 70s as warmer than normal. But we, we have this roller coaster that hits on a much regular basis. Um, Vanessa said garlic's coming up. Zinnias are still blooming. Zone 7A, yes. Um, we're zone 5B. And this is about the time of year that's normal for our first freeze. And that's why our, our gardens are... Are about done. My zinnias did great until last month. We had a, actually a super early freeze last month that spelled the end of my zinnias. I did have a couple echinacea, a couple purple coneflowers that popped up recently. I started them from seed this year, and it's unusual to get flowers in the first year, but they're going to be done with this freeze as well. Um, Liette is saying, I pulled out my bean plants and left them lying down on my garden. Good idea. That's a great way to get some nutrients back into the soil. Okay, um, what else you want to add, Kiri? Anything else on the list? I know we're starting to get towards the end of the show. <laughs> We've talked a lot about today, but I don't want to keep you from mentioning anything that you might have wanted to talk about. I did have a question for the group. Um, I, we've talked about my cats, and I love to have plants inside, just house plants but my cats destroy them. So if anybody has any tips on how to keep my cats away from my plants, <laughs> I would love to hear it. <laughs> That's good. So if you've got experience with cats and house plants, please share in the comments because Kiri will, again, as usual, go through all the comments to make sure she sees them. So if you've got cats and plants, how do you deal with them? Mm -hmm. Yep. I haven't tried to grow catnip, um, but I could try that. <laughs> I've heard that tin foil, if you put it on the soil, mm -hmm. might ha might work. And um, I, I know similar things happen in the outside garden to keep cats away as well. Yep. Yeah, I have more issues with them eating the leaves. Um, that's that's the issue. <laughs> yeah. Cat grass, yep. I've thought about getting hanging plants too, to where they can't get up to them. Yep, I see somebody just said hanging planters. <laughs> yep. That's good, that's good. <clears throat> well, I want to thank you for your time today. I appreciate you being here. I know um, this is something new and different and might be surprising for people that have checked in a little bit late to the stream, but um, this is one of those things that always trying to be innovative and fresh with some new ideas. And I want to thank you, Kiri, for being here today, sharing your expertise and joining us in this discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready to swap us out and say I hope you have a great day. Say hi to the kids, enjoy the cold and all the rest, and you'll be able to see a lot of these comments that are mm -hmm. rolling through in the screen today. So thanks yes. for being here.
Well, thank you for having me. It was fun. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll probably see you again. All right. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay. So there you have it. That was something new. Um, I did see the comments and I appreciate the feedback. I know that my microphone was uh, lower volume than her microphone. And that's what I wanted to do today. I wanted to try this new format live, see what kind of feedback we would get, how you were experiencing it. And so that's one of those things I'll have to work on before I invite other guests in. I want to make sure I, we've got all of these bugs worked out. So thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. And I'm aware of that now and see, I'll see what we can do to um, fix that in the future. That's wonderful. Um, thanks, Luz. I appreciate it. Um, it was a nice change and it was wonderful to see a little bit about what I do behind the scenes. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that um, I, I try to stay involved with my kids' lives and I'm very lucky that I have a great relationship with my adult children and it just becomes better as we all get older. And so this is just one of those things. Um, my son, who does not have a garden yet, has talked about the opportunity and the possibility when he hopes to have a new house soon of starting a garden and growing on his own because he watches some of my videos as well. So to be able to share it on screen with you really was a good opportunity today. So um, I'm, I'm glad Kiri was able to come and give up her time and do it. Um, so I see some good information passing back and forth about growing ginger indoors. Um, last week I talked about some of my favorite channels and Tony from Simplified Gardening was on the live stream. Um, go to Epic Gardening. I've seen some of the best ginger growing videos on the Epic Gardening channel. And I'm planning on actually growing some ginger of my own. I haven't done it before. And I'm doing it based on what I've learned, uh, not only reading blogs and books, but watching the videos on the Epic Gardening channel. So hopefully that can that can work out well. Um, Haas Tools has some great stuff. I haven't seen any of their stuff. Thanks, John Ann. Um, I haven't seen any of their stuff on... Uh, I take it back. I did watch, I think, a video from Haas Tools on uh, growing that. So um, check them out. Lots of good stuff. Um, Haas does have some good um, seeds that are available at great prices. They also have the live stream format that they'll throw out and they'll be chatty about what's going on with their uh, life back and forth as well as it relates to gardening. Uh, I watch a lot of gardening videos and I'm involved with a lot of channels. So I'm glad to see that a lot of the channels I think are good are also channels that you think are good as well. And I do appreciate when you all share gardening channels with me because occasionally I'll come across one that I haven't seen before and it's always nice to discover the new information out there. Um, yeah, Kimberly saying self-sufficient me. Uh, one of the, the best channels. I don't know if you saw this. Self-sufficient me has some great information in Australia. Mark is the, the one that does those videos. He has, a, he has videos telling you how to grow plants that you probably can't grow. He, he's got a video on how to grow dragon fruit, for instance. I can't grow dragon fruit, but he's so good at telling how to grow and how to set up your garden and has such great energy that that's a wonderful channel. And you may have seen that he just went over 1 million subscribers. So Self Sufficient Me is another great channel. And he's been discovered all over the world, just like I have. Now, I've been making videos for a number of years. I took a long hiatus when I was at the school garden. And I've really only been focusing for the last couple years, seriously making regular videos. So I have a library of over 200 videos. Mark has a library closer to over a thousand videos. He's been actively making videos for about eight years now. And that's kind of how YouTube works. The longer you do this, the more videos you put out, the more subscribers you get. So just a couple days ago, I went over 175,000 subscribers. Thanks to all of you who are watching 
and subscribing to the Gardener Scott channel. It's one of those things that it helps me out. The more subscribers you have, the more videos you have, the more that YouTube spreads your information out. And that's what I'm all about is getting this gardening information spread out to as many gardeners as possible. And it's all because of the support for you from you. So hopefully I'll be doing this for a number of years well as well. And I hope that you're still watching at that time to see when I go over 1 million subscribers, which is just mind blowing in concept. But I think all of us can get there at some point. And I'm certainly willing to take the journey and bring you along. So imagine all the videos that I've done already and all the topics I've done already, and I've only done about 220 videos. Imagine what the next 800 are going to be. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I have a list of between 400 and 500 different, different topics for videos. And that's not even enough to cover 800 to come. So this is going to be a great journey. And I really am enjoying bringing you all along. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that comment. Um, that's a, a real great uh, comment. And I think she's lovely, too. I appreciate that. Um, Basil, thank you so much. I appreciate that. This is fun. Um, Luciano, you're late to the party. I'm trying some new software if you're just joining in do be sure to watch this on replay if you didn't see the beginning or if you missed most of it because uh it was kind of fun sharing the screen with my daughter kiri today talking about all the gardening stuff and that brings us into the philosophy point of the week and i wanted to to tie this all together this week and so the philosophy for the week is Get your family involved in gardening. Now, it may take years. So I tried getting my kids interested in gardening 20 years ago when we first moved to Colorado Springs. But to garden, I had to clear out that garden space, which involved some heavy work. They got tired of it. They found better things to do. And it's now taken almost 20 years for them to get back into gardening. Well, I was patient, still instructive, still sharing all of my gardening experiences along the way so that especially as Kiri got back into gardening uh, or really got involved with gardening for the first time, I should say, it's something that she's becoming more and more interested in and more and more passionate with. And I think that is fantastic because as I've shared before, that's one of the reasons I do this is to share my enthusiasm. And when I can share it and then see it bounced back at me by a family member, that makes it even more exciting. And Nachi G, thank you so much for that super sticker contribution. I appreciate it. It's, it's this kind of enthusiasm and this gratitude that I'm getting from you that makes it exciting. And to see it come from my own family members is even more exciting. So I encourage you to try to do that. Now, if I had the ability to start earlier in their lives and earlier in my life, I would have. And I didn't know enough about gardening back then. I was very involved with my, my work and couldn't take the time out because I was often in different parts of the world in the military. And when I finally had the opportunity to have a garden, I did, but the kids were older at that point. If you have the opportunity to start sharing your garden with younger kids or with grandkids, you'll catch them early. And that's what I'm seeing with my granddaughters right now. When they come out to my garden, when they're working in their mother and father's garden now, they have that enthusiasm. And like Kiri said, they're, they're looking at bugs and just fascinated by what they're seeing outside. So not only is it enjoyable, enjoyable, but it's educational for the kids as well. And so I, I just so strongly encourage that you get your family involved, especially kids. If you haven't seen my video, I did it last year where I talked about the best way to learn gardening. 
And so you can learn gardening from reading a book. And you can learn gardening from watching videos like mine. And you can learn about gardening from putting seeds in the ground. And you can learn about gardening from analyzing your mistakes. There's lots of ways to learn about gardening. And I talk about that in the video. But the number one best way that I think you can do to learn gardening, the best way to learn is to teach it. If you can teach someone else how to garden, it kind of forces your brain to look at things a little differently, to, to put what you do into a language that someone else can understand. And that will strengthen that knowledge within your own brain. Well, not only do you teach gardening to get better at gardening, but if you teach a child how to garden, not only is it enjoyable, but it really gets your brain active to really start thinking about what you're doing. Because if you're putting a seed in the ground, that's simple. And you tell somebody or child, take this seed and put it in the ground. It's not that easy. Children are going to ask you questions. What is the seed? Why are we putting it in the ground? How deep do I put it in the ground? What do you mean half an inch? What is half an inch? There are so many questions that children ask when it comes to gardening, when you're telling them how to do it and explaining what it is, that it really broadens your own gardening world. One of the best experiences of my life was being the head gardener at the school, the Galileo Garden Project. Those were pre-teens for the most part, and I learned that. I would take a very simple aspect of gardening, explain it, show them how to do it, and then ask them to do it. And the questions that came about as a result of that were unbelievable. I would prepare. I thought I had covered everything. And it was nothing compared to what was in their brains and the kind of information that they needed to fully understand the concept. So for you, if you start sharing gardening with your family, assuming they're not currently involved, well, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. With your spouse, with your kids, with your grandkids, if you start that exposure to gardening and you explain what you're doing, they're going to have questions at you. And you now have to think more about what it is you're talking about, which will, in most cases, lead you to learn more. You're going to have to reference a book or a video or some other source so that you're learning more about the subject that you already thought you knew enough about. So explore that area. Take that journey. Go down that path of getting the others involved. Also, just from a practical perspective, I got my kids involved because I needed help moving all those rocks to create my garden. But that was such a negative activity that when I needed their help later on, the help wasn't to be found because they'd already had a bad gardening experience. So start off with positive experiences so that they want to help. If I had started very small, which I recommend, with just a single bed growing plants, a couple beds on the patio, kind of like Kiri and her family are doing, if I had started that way, I'm guessing that my kids would have had a much better appreciation for gardening early on than when the work was necessary. When we needed to do some of that physical labor to expand the garden, they would have been more likely to help. Instead, I just jumped right in and tried to create a huge garden in a big space that wasn't ready for a garden. So start small, not only with gardening, but with your family. Get them started with some small activity to get them motivated, to be enthusiastic, and then you may have grown a gardener for life. And you will definitely be a better gardener in the process because it really forces you to develop some of your gardening skills. So I wanted to share that with you this week and just get involved with others around you. Now, I'm, I'm talking specifically family. In the past, I've talked about neighbors and friends and all the rest, but I really think family is important. And starting with your family is an easy way 
relatively to get the gardening experience going. And so uh, start with your family. One member of your family, they might not be interested in the same things you're interested in. So you're trying to get them interested in carrots and all they care about are the insects that are on the carrots. That's okay. Refocus on the insects and now try to draw the relationship between the insects and the garden. That's, that's why this is so informative because you're talking about carrots. They want to learn about insects. Well, now you've got to learn about insects to keep them interested. That's why this is just so great as a two-way relationship for you to become a better gardener and for them to become a better gardener. So there's a little bit of the philosophy for the week. I thought I'd share that with you. I'm able to do that now. My kids are older. They appreciate it. I just so wish I could have done it earlier in their lives and earlier in my lives. But I'm still getting the same satisfaction. And both of my kids occasionally will ask a question that I can answer, but I may not know enough about. So that'll cause me to learn more about that particular subject. So there you have it. A little bit of philosophy for a week, for the week. And this is exactly my philosophy in addition to many others, is you grow a gardener for life. And there's so much to that statement. Thank you for sharing that. Because uh, gardening is one of those things that when you get the bug, uh, it's hard to get rid of. And most of us don't want to get rid of it. So um, that's great. I appreciate that. Um, and there's lots of different methods. I talked a lot about this last week. Um, regardless of what method you're trying, try something new. Uh, there's always good ideas, new things to try. Um, I think a butterfly farm is a wonderful idea. I'm going to be growing a lot more flowers to attract butterflies. And it's, it's going to be one of those places when, when it grows that we'll be able to go and sit. And of course, I'll have benches and seats so that the butterflies and the bees will buzz all around us. And I'm designing this garden specifically with my grandchildren in mind for the butterflies and the bees. So I've still got a lot more to learn and a lot more to grow, a lot more to develop along those same lines as well. So um, just wanted to go ahead and share some of that with you today. And we'll see where that leads us to the future. Uh, Butterfly Gardens, uh, I've got a lot more videos planned on this. Uh, I'll be discussing how to attract some beneficial insects, how to attract some butterflies, how to attract bees. Those are a lot of the videos I'll be working on as we move into the winter and into the spring. Because remember, I'm on that path. I've got to create at least 800 more videos uh, just to keep myself satisfied and busy over the years ahead and insects and butterflies and flowers are one part of it. Vegetable gardening is a lot of what we talk about on this channel and on this live stream, but there's a lot more to come when we talk about the insects and the flowers and all the rest as I continue to expand my garden. And I hope you'll join us along that entire journey. I am growing asparagus right now. I am growing milkweed and I'm actually growing milkweed right next to my asparagus. Not in the same bed, but yes, some great plants, lots of other things. Um, appreciate all the feedback from all of you today. And I'm enjoying this new format. I'm enjoying this new software that's enabled me to do some of this stuff. And so I uh, look forward to, I saw a lot of the comments that some of you have been giving along the way, but I also look forward to other comments that you give in the live stream and in the replay. I'm always trying to find better ways to make this channel better for you. So please feel free to share what you like, what you don't like, and I can take criticism. So if there's something about today that you didn't like, by all means, share that so that I can improve it for next time. Um, Kristen, so glad to see that you were here the whole time. I know that you've had to check in late. Um, and so um, Janan is asking what the software is. This is a program from Stream Labs, or I'm sorry, sorry, Stream Yard. So Stream Yard is a streaming software. Um, I have been using OBS. OBS is on your own computer, 
and it has a lot of great benefits and I may continue to use OBS periodically in the future. But StreamYards is actually um, not downloaded to your computer. It's something that you are streaming through their software in the cloud. And so it's not as expansive as some of the other programs out there, but it does enable me to have a guest on the show very easily. And you saw some of the things that I've been experimenting with today. Um, so Kristen's asking, do I have a, a video specifically about growing in South Texas? And so I've talked about this a lot in the live chats and on videos. I try to stay away from videos and even discussion where I'm talking specifically about how to grow in Indonesia or how to grow in South Texas or how to grow in the UK or even how to grow in Colorado. I think one of the reasons this community is so strong is because we have gardeners from all over the world. And so I can give you guidance. I can give you suggestions. I'll often give you recommendations, but I'm I'm really trying to avoid saying this is how you grow because even in South Texas, if I had a video about how to grow in South Texas and I lived in Del Rio, Texas for a year, hot, dry, some conditions that are extremely difficult to grow in. That was before I was a gardener even wanting to garden. But I realized that if I were to do a video about how to grow in South Texas, well, there's so many microclimates and there's so many different regions within South Texas that my video right off the bat would be right for some people and wrong for other people. So I would much rather offer those suggestions, those philosophies, and I always say check with people in your area who are already doing it. So if you want to have a garden in your area, Indonesia, the UK, South Texas, Canada, or Colorado, find gardeners in your area who are already gardening successfully. Those are the best people to get information from because they've figured out what works in your area with your soil, your climate, your weather patterns, your insects. All of that is important. And I can't sit here and tell anyone else around the world what their garden is like with all of those different parameters. You've got to figure out for yourself. But that's also why I say share information. Because if you are having some success in your particular city, in your area, there's a gardener out there who is looking for help, trying to find out how they can grow a successful garden. And you may be the person to make it happen. Well, there we have our time. It's been fun today. Thank you so much for allowing me to share the experience with not just you, but you spending the time with my daughter and being so gracious and so nice in your comments. It's been wonderful. I look forward to seeing you again next Monday with another live stream, same time, same channel, and it's all going to be good. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you, if you're in the cold, can get out of the cold like we're forecast to be and can get back out into the garden. Thanks so much for sharing your time. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.